Welcome uh, everyone uh, to this uh, BCO uh, case study seminar. Uh, I'm Howard Morgan, the founder and managing director of, of Real Service, a customer experience consultancy working in the property industry. Uh, today's uh, seminar is entitled the Customer Experience uh, Revolution Case Study. Uh, and we're going to receive a, a, a presentation from uh, Savills looking at how they've taken BCO's research uh, and develop that uh, in their business. Uh, and uh, we're joined by uh, Chris Richmond, a uh, partner at, uh, and head of real estate at uh, PwC. Uh, and from Savills, uh, John Redfern, Adam Bray, uh, and Tanya Broadfield. Um, so by way of introduction, I'm just going to ask each of them just to say, uh, introduce themselves and, and say a little bit about their interest in, in the today's subject. Uh, let's start with Chris. Thank you, Howard. I think, uh, firstly, you've promoted me uh, very kindly to partner. I'm, I'm head of real estate for, uh, for PwC UK, overseeing all their occupational estate. I uh, have a really keen interest in, in this uh, customer experience revolution, having overseen as uh, head of the occupier group uh, the last pieces of research dating back to 2015, which I know we'll be covering. Um, so really, really pleased to be part of the ongoing discussion. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, John? Uh, yes, uh, John Redfern. I'm a director in, um, at Savills in our London business space, and I focus primarily on our central London office portfolio uh, and our approach to how we manage those buildings, which um, is, is RISE. Okay, thank you. And uh, Tanya? Hi, um, I'm a senior sustainability consult consultant for Savills and um, I think that sustainability plays a key role in the customer experience because it really encompasses where the interests of the environment and of society and, the, and of the economy meet. Okay, thank you Tanya and uh, welcome and Adam. Morning everybody, um, I am a director at Savills, I work with uh, John and Tanya. Um, Prior to um, Savills, I was with WeWork and prior to that Crown Estate. So I've sort of seen the, um, you know, customer experience lens through a number of different um, sides of the fence, as it were. Um, and I'm really interested in the way in which um, both the physical and the social elements around placemaking um, kind of contribute towards customer experience. So it's great to be here today. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome all. Uh, as, uh, as participants in the webinar, you'll have the chance to ask questions throughout the event. You'll see somewhere on your screen a little box or a little uh, icon that says Q&A. So you're invited to um, submit questions at any time or comments. And I'll be, we'll be monitoring those throughout the event. So let's, uh, let's make a start. This is the, the running order. I'm going to give a very brief overview of the research that uh, Real Service has carried out for BCO uh, going back to 2015. Um, then John's going to uh, present uh, the, the case study and then we'll open up into a, a panel discussion and uh, we look forward to receiving your questions. Uh, we'll finish at 12 o'clock uh, at the very latest. So let's get into the subject. If you've read today's Times, um, you'll think that the, uh, the office industry is, uh, is uh, headline news. Uh, and there's two stories actually in today's Times. One about the reluctance of city office workers to return. We're all enjoying working from home so much, WFH. Um, and secondly, will life in our offices ever be the same? So this is mainstream news. The future, what we'd be discussing today, the way our buildings work for, for businesses today is mainstream news. And, and it's fascinating to explore uh, that subject uh, together with our, our guests. Um, for, my, for me, my journey in this field started uh, nearly 30 years ago when I first went uh, to North America. Uh, I was looking for another approach. I, I was, I'd heard that some interesting things were happening in the early 90s in, in North America. And I attended a seminar um, which uh, was, gave me my light bulb moment. Uh, and that simple idea was that uh, we're not in the bricks and mortar industry, but we're in the hospitality industry, that our business needs to be about people. Uh, bricks and mortar, of course, are important, but really we're a, a people industry. I, I brought that idea back to the UK and uh, uh, applied it in my role at uh, working with BAA, the airports company, and subsequently through our work uh, as a, a consultancy over the last 20 years. It's interesting to see how that idea has, uh, has rooted uh, and uh, 
I was pleased to see uh, some 27 years later on, uh, Stephen Hubbard in his uh, interview as retiring chairman of CBRE, um, really highlighting to anyone today coming into the industry that uh, unless you understand how occupiers think, however are you going to create a successful property investment? And as he says there, I would counsel anyone from coming into capital markets and to the investment side of our industry uh, before you understand the occupier side. So, um, and that's no coincidence, Stephen Hubbard's on the, the board of Workspace and uh, has been immersed in, in this way of running uh, property. So our industry has changed and is changing, but as we all know, we have some way uh, to go before we fully delight our customers. This subject is really important. We're in the worst recession for 300 years. It's not a question is it's coming, we're in it. And uh, therefore it's gonna challenge all of us to think about ways in which we can retain uh, and attract uh, our customers. And I sense that the battle lines are drawing. Um, two articles, one from the Financial Times, landlords and tenants feel the pain, um, fraught relationships at the brink and anyone who would have read Luke Johnson's uh, piece in the Sunday Times the pre weekend before last, talks, uh, he, he is talking about abuse. The landlords are literally abusing their tenants. And he sees this as a defining moment in the relationship between landlord and tenant. The government is listening to uh, its tenants, its cut, to our cut tenants, our customers, and uh, certainly the uh, steps taken to uh, impact on the ability to forfeit leases and, and take other financial uh, redress seems to be siding with the customer, so, which is interesting. Now, as uh, we said at the beginning, the BCO is, has not been caught flat-footed on this subject. In fact, it's been publishing research for the last, uh, since 2002. Uh, and these three reports, which I'm going to take you through very briefly uh, in 2015, 17 and 19, are a wealth of information uh, for anyone who's looking to understand uh, what customer experience really means to our industry. So I'm just gonna give you a couple of headlines from each report before I invite uh, John to take us through the case study. So back in uh, 2015, we published our first report called Building Performance, Rethinking the Relationship Between Owners, Managers and Occupiers. And that report really was a response to a, a gap that we had become evident Commissioned by the BCO uh, occupier group uh, led by Chris Richmond, uh, our starting point was evidence from that group that they only had a one in five chance of having a responsive landlord. Major corporate occupiers in the UK only had a one in five chance of having a responsive landlord or managing agent. And contrasting that, what they were saying to us was that the new spaces of service providers, including the Regis's and the WeWorks and the office groups and, and so on, typically they were providing nine out of 10 uh, satisfaction, a far more responsive service than the traditional property manager or owner. So our brief in the first report was to look at why does that gap exist? And in summary, it's reflected in this chart. As part of the, uh, research, we got groups of owners, managers together and uh, occupiers together. In fact, we got them together in the same room, split them into three separate corners, but asked them the same question, which was, what does a well-performing building look like? And interestingly enough, we heard three different things. Our owners told us it was all about income and capital appreciation. Our managers told us it was all about rent collection, service charge management, health and safety. And our occupiers uh, told us it was neither of those things to them, a well-performing building is one which enables them to run their business profitably, uh, gives them the flexibility of lease, uh, able to demonstrate and represent their brand, and an efficient and effective workplace. So what we identified in that first report was a lack of alignment within our industry around the fundamental needs of, of the three principal protagonists. And we put forward this uh, Venn diagram, and at the center, we, what we call the building performance sweet spot, five aspects which would bring together those three uh, groups, principally a balanced financial outcome, improved customer satisfaction, sustainability and uh, corporate responsibility, placemaking uh, and staff and visitor wellbeing. And it's probably no coincidence that we have people on this panel representing each of those areas, Tanya, uh, corporate responsibility, sustainability, Adam, uh, placemaking. 
I suggest if we were running this exercise today, there would be another thing on that list, and that would be COVID-19. Our response as an industry to that challenge is something which brings the three protagonists together. Each of us have a, have a common interest in finding a, a way of responding to the, the crisis. The uh, second report published in 2017, Office Standards uh, and uh, Customer Experience, highlighted or created a, a new checklist, which you can just see the headings here, and a scorecard. So six self-assessment checklists and 118 best practices. And, and, uh, and uh, John's going to explain how they've taken this work and developed it into the, uh, the RISE uh, model. So six areas in the checklist covering culture, design, collaboration, leadership and training, operational excellence and performance measurement. And in that report, we highlighted or introduced this uh, customer experience pyramid. And th the thinking behind this being that uh, as an industry, if we can focus on three things, getting the basics right, making our customers' life easy, and creating a, a strong commotion, emotional connection with each one, uh, that really that's the essence of, of great customer experience. And having identified that those two areas, uh, of the, uh, the two areas of development in, the, in that report, uh, our third report looked at, do we as an industry have the customer experience skills that are required? Do we have a skills gap? And if so, how can we close that gap? And what we identified was a vision for tomorrow's property and asset manager. We called it the alchemist's vision. Um, and that identified that we needed to develop more rounded individuals with three skill sets, business skills, customer experience skills, uh, and technical skills. And the traditional training of a, of a surveyor, comp good as it is, um, needed to be broadened to include a much wider uh, set of, of skills. So inclusion in our third report, and perhaps uh, and we could not have exactly seen what was happening in the COVID-19 era today, but uh, what we focused on then, uh, even the amount of disruption even then, uh, 12 months ago, was such that we said that the forces shaping the way we work call for an equally disruptive response to the ways we serve our customers. And I think never a truer word has said about the COVID-19 era, that's, that's putting uh, disruption on a new level. So how are we responding to our customers' needs? Uh, and in, in a sense, that's the, the challenge to the Savills team to take us through their case study and uh, how they're going to respond to that challenge. So with that, let me uh, introduce John and uh, invite you to uh, take us through the case study. Yeah, uh, thank you, Howard. Um, that gives a, a great background to uh, sort of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, we've only got four slides, and I think it would be much more interesting for everyone if um, we delve into a sort of Q and A session around um, what we've done, rather than uh, death by PowerPoint. But um, I think, firstly. Um, why we did it. Um, we wanted to improve how we engage with our customers um, and we wanted to make that a real point of difference in terms of how we delivered our service. Um, the BCO guidance um, and best practice doc documents really resonated with us um, and we wanted to explore after the first paper sort of how we could quantify service delivery uh, and drive improvement in customer experience in a, in a transparent and consistent way. Um, and how we, how we sort of started that process really was um, at one of our buildings, King's Place, we had an excellent team there and we started to just experiment with discussions with our, our occupiers about what they wanted to see. Um, also working with um, a company called SGS who do audits for hospitality and just started to look at how we could shape um, an audit process and so what we've then um, developed really is a customer focused strategy um, that frames our culture and specialism of, of management of prime office and mixed use assets. And, and simply that gives us a framework and guidance for consistency. It allows us to do the operational excellent piece well. So everyone should expect that the basics of property management are done brilliantly. Um, it gives us a platform to engage with our customers um, and create a place that they want to visit and feel proud to, to be part of. Um, 
improve the, the customer experience around sustainability and wellness. And we've got um, Adam and Tanya here to talk a little bit more about that as well. But the most important thing, which we thought was the, the missing piece, was to, to allow us to quantify and measure via um, an audit process. So, uh, as I say, that's what we started to explore at King's Place and how, how that would work. And similar to, to Howard's slides, we broke that into to five sectors um, which we would measure. So leadership, management and innovation being one, health and safety, sustainability and wellness, um, property and financial performance uh, and placemaking, community. And then finally, um, corporate social responsibility and how we could best align everyone's goals around that. Um, that developed into a 92 question audit process, um, which basically it focuses on the process you've got in place for each, each element. Uh, it checks whether you're following best practice um, and if you're implementing it as you should be doing, but then it challenges you around how are you improving uh, and how are you innovating in, in that service delivery. And I think just the, the, the main thing to keep referring back to is this is done in conjunction with your customers and your occupiers. So discussing that with them, ensuring that it's uh, specific to that, proper, uh, that particular building. But actually we found it quite difficult to, to articulate what we were doing. Um, and it, it, because it was focused on, on the audit process, um, we wanted to just explore how we could um, make it resonate with people more. So we uh, ended up with five pillars. So these are the five pillars on the left, um, which are um, operational excellence. So you should expect that you get operational excellence as a, as a very minimum and then build from there. Um, customer engagement so that you're using innovation and research um, and surveys to engage with your occupiers and understand what they want. Um, customer experience, so play shaping and the role that that plays and that's become ever more uh, relevant. And environment, uh, so sustainability, health and wellbeing, corporate social responsibility. And then the, the final piece is, the, is to evolve the service delivery. So continue to, to improve, uh, to be transparent and to, to show um, that we're a forward-thinking managing agent acting on behalf of a forward-thinking landlord. So it, moving on to the, the, the next slide, which demonstrates the actual process that, that we would go through typically. Um, the first point is back to discussions with the occupiers. So have individual meetings, face-to-face -face meetings, surveys, um, your occupier meetings, whatever format that might be. It's really important to find out what um, they want from the building, what are they expecting from the building, what do they want you and the landlord to deliver for them. Once you've done that, we would go through an, a, an internal um, audit process or RISE assessment, which would help us to quantify the, the existing base level. Um, from that, we'd put together a management plan. So we'd identify the weaknesses and look at a program of improvement and how we can move forward with that which we would share with our customers and we'd be really open in that process and say, um, as you'll see on the next slide, look, we don't think we're performing particularly well on place shaping. What would you like to see? Um, and then the final piece is the, the, the independent certified assessment where we have SGS to come back in. So it's not Savile saying, this is how brilliant we are. It's actually uh, someone else coming back in um, to do the, the certification. And then we use that data to demonstrate the performance so on the spider web slide the, the third slide um this is to demonstrate at canon place which is one of the sort of early iterations of we took over the management um on behalf of a new client we assessed what the current position is and the, the skills of the site team what the occupiers want and then we put in place a program of improvement to really drive forward those changes and and when you see it like that, it's quite powerful to be able to demonstrate that um, that's the improvement and particularly when it's done by um, an independent auditor. And then finally, um, the point around being able to do this is this, if you do it across your whole portfolio, um, you then get some really powerful um, data back in terms of trends across the portfolio, where you're performing well, where you're not performing well, where you can improve, 
Um, but it's also important when looking at this to know that every building can't be everything for every man. So there will be particular buildings that by their design, by the way they're used, just aren't going to be able to perform um, in certain elements. And um, a building we look after where that really struck home was we were asking about place shaping and what they'd like to see. And actually the overwhelming feedback from the customer was, this is a building for traders. We're not interested in customer experience, per se in terms of events. Our experience is the journey through the building. It needs to be quick, secure, as frictionless as possible. So that's what we want to focus on. So that's what we did focus on. So this, this, these results enable us to, to benchmark our portfolio, start to judge, judge the team, link in KPIs, and then create a competition as well so that you, you're driving that improvement forward. Um, and we're still in the, in the sort of early stages of, of this. We've been doing it for two or three years and it takes a long time to, to get the processes and the culture right. Um, so that's a, the, the case studies been launched in detail on BCA website. Um, so I won't go into the, the full details, but that's just a, a, an overview of how the BCA research really resonated with us. And we took that to, to influence our, um, our service delivery. Thank you very much, John. Uh, just a, a question on the last slide we are just looking at. Each of those horizontal lines represents a building. Is that correct? Correct, yes. Yeah, so you've, you've applied this model across, what's that, 50 plus buildings? Yes, so it's, um, it's, quite, it's probably more than that now. Um, and we've started to look at how the model works in, um, in Europe as well. So um, we've, we've got four or five sites in our European countries that have, have started to adapt it to their local environment as well. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to say we're starting to get some questions in uh, from our audience. And uh, so in a minute, we're going to be, I've got some pre-prepared questions to uh, tempt our panellists, but also I'm very keen to take your questions and, and uh, why not we shoot in straight away with a question from uh, Phil Breeden. Thank you, Phil. A uh, question for John. Who from the occupier customer do you generally seek feedback from? Is it the facilities manager or is it the wider occupants? That's it's, it's a great question, actually, because I think traditionally you would be garnering that information from the uh, occupier FM or the office manager who often can be a, a, a blocker for, and Chris can jump in and, and slap my wrists uh, <laughs> if, he, if he wants to, but can sometimes be a blocker for actually finding out what, um, what the individual user of the building wants to see in terms of service delivery. So although it's difficult to get feedback from, from the whole um, user uh, of the building, it is important to try and get that as much as you can using um, surveys, um, but the starting point is often with the, with the occupier FM. Great, thanks Phil for that question. Please uh, keep them coming. Uh, Chris, why, perhaps I'll ask you just an overall reaction as, a, as a, an important customer of our industry um, to the case study uh, and perhaps a, a comment on the question that was just raised. Who, who, who should uh, uh, a property manager or owner seek feedback from when they're trying to assess the impact of uh, the customer experience service they're delivering? Well, firstly, can I uh, congratulate uh, Savills on a, on a brilliant piece of work. Um, when, when we set out to, to, uh, to, to change the industry, if you like, back in uh, 2015 with the original bit of research, Howard, obviously you, you were part of that. Um, we were looking for um, lasting change in the industry. And, and you, you, you mentioned the stat of two out of 10 uh, occupiers were dissatisfied with the service they were getting from a landlord at the time. I, th I think it was about 17%, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I think from, because you did a similar survey back in 2002, and we did the, the, a similar survey in 2015 over those 13 years, very little had changed. Um, and now five years on, it feels as though we are making those step changes now. Um, and this is a great example of, of the changes that we're seeing within the industry to focus very much uh, on on the customer, the occupier, um, and certainly, you know, from from my organisation, we are definitely seeing that uh, across the board. Uh, far more focus uh, on uh, the running of the building, the servicing of the building. Um, I would say, just picking up on the question, um, we've always felt, from from an occupier's point of view, unloved, 
And what I mean by that is no one really asks you, what do you want? No one comes and knocks on your door and says, how are we doing? Um, and it may be, picking up on John's point, it, it, it's a question of who, you, who do you ask the question of? Um, we have office managers in each of our locations and uh, their remit is very much to run the, 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 the office there uh, to a very high standard uh, based on the conversations they're having with uh, the lead partner in those offices. So they should have the answers. Um, however, you know, as a central real estate team supporting them within PwC, uh, I guess we're the driving force so I, I think it's a combination of all of them. Uh, certain, certainly getting the operational day-to-day -day requirements at a local level and getting more of a strategic steer from a central real estate level, if that's available. Excellent. Howard, can I jump in here quickly? Um, I think that's a really relevant point, Chris. Um, we're often dealing with a phrase that's been used uh, fairly recently is like the silent majority. Um, and if you look at anything from pre-planning consultation around uh, town developments right through to how we manage our buildings day to day, um, actually the majority of people will not um, have an opinion necessarily or, or, or have the means by which to express that opinion. So you know, that's where we need the greater embracing of technology. Um, and I think that's where um, programmes like RISE do come into their own. Excellent. Let's bring, let's talk about the current era in the COVID-19 era. The, the, the RISE model was developed, if I understand correctly, before the, uh, the model, before the, uh, the crisis. Um, I wonder what steps, Adam and, and Tanya, you've taken to update it for the, with the new era. How relevant is the model to the, the period we're now living in, Adam or Tanya? I think um, Tanya, I can jump in here and then pass on to you perhaps. Um, my first point really was that um, COVID-19 has, has almost snowballed um, the CX revolution. Um, and by that, there are sort of three contexts. Um, uh, I joined the other day where someone said BC, DC and AC before COVID, during COVID and after COVID. And I think actually um, they're all useful lenses through which to, to view this situa situation. Um, obviously, we've all heard of uh, the phrases space as a service. Um, leaning much more towards a you know, model that is focused on um, hospitality and leaning on, on the hospitality, hospitality industry. Um, and I think your point around that building sweet spot, Howard, is really interesting here because, um, you know, it's not just the um, physical environment, it's actually how you then uh, provide a, a framework around place shaping, a framework about sustainability. Um, what I would call the ultimate rise of, of business to business to consumer. So the end user really caring about the environment they operate in, but also, you know, where they shop um, and, and how they shop as well and that sort of thing. So um, really interesting, the building sweet spot is no longer just about the physical um, nature of the space, but also the, the social uh, elements. Um, ultimately, um, you know, what we're looking to do is create organizational stickiness. Um, and, you know, really um, in, in, the, in the before COVID scenario, what we were, you know, looking to do was, was um, marry the, the social side of things, um, i.e. The, 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 the interactions between people with then great spaces like the WeWork model that people want to spend time in. Um, and now we're looking really in the during COVID phase of what does the value of space mean? Um, really um you know those that are going to benefit greatly in the short term are those that have um greater use of amenity in outdoor spaces um so how do we create better flexibility with those physical spaces to we'll enable to... yeah Sorry. absolutely um and then and then just really finally some details around how your um what uh, what community means uh, in in the new era? So we'll, perhaps we'll come on to that. Can I bring yeah, in absolutely. Tanya at this point? In fact, we have a question from the floor, which is relevant to uh, the subject, which is <coughs> from uh, Steve Dixon. Thank you for your question, Steve. Um, the media has picked up the fact that working from home has had a short-term benign effect on the local environment uh, with focus on less traffic. Is there a risk that occupiers stroke landlords might push sustainability down their agenda at this time? And particularly, I know from previous recessions when there's been cheap fossil fuels, uh, people have uh, found it quite tempting to, uh, to, uh, to buy and use more fuel rather than uh, work to uh, more sustainable targets. So uh, how, do, how are you looking at this period and, and the outlook for the sustainability as an issue? Um, I, I think actually the virus 
could end up being an accelerator for people considering sustainability factors rather than promoting any kind of um, slowdown. Um, uh, consideration of sustainability uh, improves an organization's resilience um, and I think we're going to see organizations considering risk in a in a far more proactive and managed way than ever before I mean I'm sure everybody had a risk register before but who amongst us could honestly say they had on it global pandemic and everybody will have to work at home <laughs> um, you know so I think that attention to to risk management will um, will be will be long lasting and I, we're definitely seeing an, uh, an uplift if anything um, in organizations organizations wanting to talk to us about sustainability and wanting to have sustainability strategies and I think that's because they like us really want to create a positive crisis legacy um, and why not take this opportunity to to build a better future um, and I think what lockdown's done is um, sh you know debunked one of these um, myths that I've been dealing with for my entire career about about climate change for example that the individual action doesn't make a difference um, and we've seen that it we've seen quite categorically that it does um, you know we are staying at home we are having these significant reductions on um, co2 emissions on air pollution and i think that it's it's not comparable to 2008 and the recession um, for a couple of two you know two main reasons the first one is that um, the wheels were already in motion. Um, I've, you know, been in my career now in sustainability for kind of 17, getting on 18 years. And the last kind of 12 to 18 months before the virus, never seen so much attention on sustainability. Um, the UK's uh, government's commitment to net zero carbon, um, you know, the ever present effects of, of climate change being tangible all around us, like UK flooding, Australian wildfires, the blue planet effect, you know, uh, uh, un, um, unparalleled levels of public interest in plastic pollution, um, public activism on the streets, Greta Thunberg, so all of the wheels are in motion for that. And then I think the second thing about the virus is this attention on, on health and well-being. And I think that there, there's some real kind of work-life balances um, uh, gained from working at home. And there's this real increased community-minded spirit um, that we have at the moment. And, and I think there's a, you know, a definite sense among many of us, all those individuals, that we don't want to lose that. And I, and I really think that that will, will take us through. Mm. Well, it'd be interesting to, to get Chris's reaction to that. Chris, you're no doubt you're um, spending a lot of uh, day and possibly uh, midnight or considering these, uh, these issues. Uh, how's it looking for PwC as a business today? I mean, I, what, what I think is, is, uh, has been a really assuring for, reassuring for all organisations is the technology has is, is, is been very resilient. And, yeah. uh, you know, we, we've got 24,500 people in the UK, um, all uh, working, working from home at the moment. And, uh, you know, the IT teams in all the organisations, it, it seems, are, are the heroes in all of this because, uh, you know, we, we can ma maintain, uh, you know, productivity um, whilst working remotely. Um, I, think, I think, you know, from, from a personal point of view and perhaps some of the messages I'm picking up from my team and others is, um, you know, they, they do miss that social interaction. That, that, is, that is part of, uh, you know, what we're about uh, as human beings, um, and we thrive off, off that. Um, I, think, I think I've always looked upon the office as, um, you know, a workplace of choice alongside working from home, alongside perhaps working from another site, whether that be client or a cafe or what have you. So it's always been a choice. Um, however, it feels as though we're being pushed down sort of sort of a, a mandatory route at the moment. And I think that uh, a lot of people are feeling that lack of freedom, perhaps the liberty has been taken away. Um, that lack of choice, if you like, is, is the biggest impact on people. However, I would pick up on what Tanya was saying is that, you know, as, as perhaps offices start to open hopefully over the coming months is you know it's all about well-being it's about managing the anxiety of people um you know when we've looked at you know sustainability targets in the past all our strategy for our offices has been town center locations principally closer to transport links and it's those transport links it's the it's it's perhaps the risk people see to their health of uh, getting onto public transport going to the office uh, which could be the major uh, challenge for a lot of people in the coming months um, and would all stop people perhaps uh, delaying people going back into the office. Um, 
and and I think that's that's where we see the biggest challenge: giving them the comfort that you know they they will have the safety and well-being uh, of coming back to 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 use the workplace. And and just <laughs> if I may, just pick, picking up on that, actually, I think what what we've noticed actually is it's accelerated that that collaboration between occupiers and and landlords as well, um, and all the team meetings that we have, all the internal discussions, really focus around. You know, have you garnered the feedback from from the occupiers how are they going to use the building what do they want to see how can we help them reassure their their, their staff um, around things like perhaps the use of temperature um, scanning and, and the problems that um, that may pose but also around wellness versus perhaps um, increase in utility costs if you're trying to improve the air quality but all of this is done in 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 collaboration. So actually, it's been it's been one of the the sort of one of the positives to come out of it is is oh, that really increased. Positive. Sounds really positive, uh, John. Of course, all this uh, change has uh, places extra burden on you as managing agents, um, um, on owners looking at the uh, design and uh, the facilities they provide, and, and uh, I guess on, on customers um, in terms of. Uh, how you make your premises work for you in the in the, in the two meter era? A um, uh, question um, that I would like to put is that there's a cost issue here, um, and I, I wonder. I'd be interested to get the reviews uh, of uh, uh, Chris and uh, John or your your team members on who's going to bear the extra cost of providing these additional facilities and uh, uh, and safety features. Uh, well, I'm happy to, to start. I think it goes back to that collaboration point again. I think as long as you've spoken to your customer and engaged with, with what they want to see in the building, then you're going to have a lot less problems further down the line. I think where, where those issues will arise is if you're taking um, decisions without factoring in what people want. Um, and that I'll go back to sort of the M and &E, &E point and the um, the guidance that's out there about increasing fresh air and operating times. If as a managing agent or as a landlord we took the decision, we think it's the best thing to do. We're going to do it, and actually the occupiers didn't necessarily want to see that uh, in place. Then you're going to have significant additional costs, which you've got a problem in terms of of how that's recovered if you've not consulted. Um, I think get my little violin out and uh, as a managing agent and say we're, we always take the, the brunt of um, peaks like this and our, our costs are, are generally fixed so you know, we, it's, it's just one of the things that we, we have to deal with um, but hopefully it will help promote the value of a, of a proactive managing agent and, um, and, and look at the that point who, who's yeah. Who, um, who do you perceive, uh, where do you see the costs uh, falling? Is it a worry for you? Sorry, Howard, was that, that to me? Yes, please. Sorry, you faded. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, when we're, we're going through extraordinary times and, uh, you know, the, the well-being and health of our, our people is, is the most important thing. Um, so we, we need to ensure that we provide the very best um, in terms of precautions and you know we we take our guidance I guess from the government um, some of some of the policies and guidelines that are coming out there um, I think what we would want from our managing agents is transparency in understanding uh, perhaps uh, the level of service the quality of the service that perhaps is being looked at um, quite often a lot of you know what we see certainly as business as usual is driven by cost um, and it's not necessarily what occupiers want they they they, they want uh, a level of service and they they want uh, value for money and the quality to go with it so a lot of that comes by open discussion about you know what uh, is uh, relevant for for occupiers for an occupier and I, and I do take the the view and I'm, I'm sure John will come back and just sort of say yeah but we've got to keep everyone happy within the building um, and I take that to a degree I, I also sort of think well aren't we at a time where we can bespoke certain services for certain uh, occupiers within buildings um, you know we can do it in the motor industry can't we and have a whole range of uh, options for our cars um, can't we do that for services so I think 
you know, it's a long way around, but I think in terms of uh, the costs of overcoming, uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 issues and what have you, surely they have to be down as a service charge item, but they certainly need to be justified. Uh, and there needs to be detailed uh, each line item. Quite often we get lists of costs, but very little behind it to tell us what, what level of and quality of service is being delivered. Hmm. We've got a couple of questions coming in, both actually, uh, on the cost issue. Um, Stephen Walker um, echoes the point I've just raised. I'm going to, uh, in fact, this question is just at the foot of the, my screen, so I'm going to have to come on to that second. So let's take the first question from uh, Dale Hoskins, um, a question actually for John. Um, she says, uh, assuming uh, that there are costs associated with the implementation of RISE, would you find the buy-in easier, more palatable for the occupier or the landlord? If, if cash flow is even more important now. So I suppose that uh, question for you, John, does this cost more to deliver the RISE model uh, and who bears the cost, the occupier or the landlord? Neither. Uh, well, I think the, the, the principles um, around the BCA research and also our service delivery um, don't cost anything, uh, anything additional. You know, the to try and be, collaborate more, to try and deliver better customer experience um, can all be done without incurring costs. And certainly our fees um, are no different. We've just repositioned the skills within the team. So the role of the surveyor has changed and you can't be everything to every man anymore. Um, so you know, we have more people like Tanya, people like Adam from different backgrounds with different skill sets that help deliver that service. So. It, it, it doesn't have to cost more, certainly if you start to want to introduce technology and you want to introduce sustainability initiatives, then yes, there, there may be costs associated with it. But again, that comes back to understanding what the, um, what the occupiers actually want um, and what, what the landlord sees from the building. And then our role is to marry those, those together and, and deliver that service. So, um, you know, there's no point um, and we know this from experience, say, take occupier portals. There's no point forcing an occupier portal on a building when the usage just isn't there and, and no one's using it. But actually, now's perhaps the opportunity where people are seeking more information around the building and want to, want to know what's happening, want to know about the air quality. So there's, there's finding that balance. And I think the cost, the cost point is it links to... Um, landlords um, and owners understanding that they want to deliver better services to the customer so how do they factor this in as part of their capex costs um, rather than necessarily trying to um, put all the costs through the service charge or is it in the design phase so I think it's a, it's a combination of everything and it depends on on the building that you're dealing with and the, and the types of people that are using it. Yeah thank you. Um, Stephen Walker thank you for your question on cost I think we've, we've spent quite a bit of time on, on that subject. So um, I'm going to move on to a, a question for, for Tanya um, and uh, from, from Imogen Webb. Uh, this is regarding your point about individual impact and how we have seen that our individual actions matter in the current era. Uh, to what level should service office providers enforce safety measures on individuals who make up our occupier groups going forward? For example, insisting they follow certain hygiene safety measures our occupiers actions not only affect employees of their own company but other companies and who share the building and their ops teams who run it so it's a question specifically interesting about serviced office providers and uh, whether they should impose uh, safety standards on, on the businesses in, in their buildings uh, any any view on that uh, tanya yeah i think i think you know we're in unprecedented times and and my initial kind of reaction to that would be um you know always to say no we don't want to mandate you know people behavior and but but unfortunately the times are in mean that that you know things have changed considerably and i think i think as a as a general kind of journey for for occupier engagement what we always want to be be moving a, a, I, I like to cite this kind of four-step process that initially on an occupier journey we start by informing people what we're doing then we move on to involving them then we move to collaboration until eventually we're leading we're providing leadership but i think that's what the the rise program does 
it provides that that leadership and it makes it very tangible what actions that uh, you're required to take um and you know in the sector like i count my myself in this we're very guilty of talking too much <laughs> uh and it's it's very difficult for people to understand what are the uh, tangible actions that i need to to take to to achieve this um you know en enigma of sustainability um and what rise does is it makes it really practical um and not only does it give you tangible actions but it gives them to you in the order that you should do them that makes most sense practically so so the rise framework really helps to to um let occupiers understand what they need to do okay thanks thanks Tony. can move the conversation on and, and pick up a question bring in adam at, at this point uh, and chris i'm interested in your views as as well um it re relates to the in town versus out of town office discussion and uh, it's linked to a uh, question we've had in from uh, Helen Garthwaite. Um, Pre-COVID, a lot of effort around customer experience was around building community, bringing people literally together in, and uh, with events and, and uh, so on. Um, we're now with uh, in the uh, in the social distancing era. We're now challenged to bring people together, literally even to bring them under one roof. Do you do you see this having an impact on the way we deliver customer experience? Uh, and uh, particularly, do you think this is going to uh, encourage more businesses to think about out of town locations, perhaps, I assume, where there, there may be more space? Um, Adam and Chris, uh, Adam first. I think it's um, a, a you know, fascinating point. Um, We've, we've described it in the past as a sort of the new elephant in the room <clears throat> where previously we wanted to bring communities together both physically and, and digitally. Now, um, you know, we're seeing obviously that, that distancing in place, um, which means we, we can't obviously um, encourage that, that sort of physical interaction. Um, from a, um, you know, an ROI or now as, as uh, experience makers have coined return on experience, I think we're looking more at a return to experience. So how do we um, facilitate um, uh, that need for community? And, and arguably there's never been a more important time for community. And we have seen that, you know, locally on our doorsteps. Um, and so I guess the, the, the rise of, of local is a very pertinent point here because we're seeing how, um, you know, the local um, you know, retailers have, have been thriving um, and supporting the community, how we have each been, uh, you know, leaning on for support our, our own local communities. But then regarding, um, I think, the, the, the pre-COVID era, we were looking very much at uh, a model that, that was about enhanced flexibility. And I think that's why I said COVID has basically snowballed the, the CX revolution because um, the greater need for flexibility is, is now upon us because um, that need to be able to work from home, to use technology or to work in a, um, you know, a remote location or in a cafe or in your central office, um, I think um, will prevail because um, that need for flexibility, allowing for people's sensitivities, particularly with regards to COVID, but also about how this has changed the way we look at, at, at work. So, um, you know, decentralization is, is a thing, um, a topic now on everybody's minds. And I think, I think certainly um, it will be um, impacting the way that we um, continue to interact. But on that point then of decentralization, I think you may have touched on it lightly before you're, you, you've, concentrated yeah. your offices around uh, railway and station and uh, public transport hubs Do you, is this going to cause a, a temporary or fundamental rethink in your location preferences you know you, you need a crystal ball i think at this stage i, I know i all all corporates i think are you know trying to second guess uh, what the impact will be um, you know, people's behaviour is going to be key to this, you know, um, you know, we talked about the anxieties of going into work, the public transport and what have you. Um, if you, if you sort of start to look at perhaps bringing smaller satellite offices, for want of a better word, into your portfolio, they have to be places that people are attracted to, they have to have a, a reason to be there, you know, we talk about workplace of choice. So um, you ne then get into a debate around, you know, what would be the optimum size and what facilities do you put in there um, to make them attractive for people to, to go there. Um, and traditionally, you know, you sort of look at an office really as being a place that, you know, offers you a whole range of services and experiences uh, that you want to go and support functions. So, um, you know, it reminds me 
I think BT had a, had a 20, 30 years ago where they had lots of satellite offices dotted around, but who wants to be, you know, perhaps one of the people that make your journey there? It might only be, I don't know, quarter of an hour, half an hour away as opposed to an hour you'd normally expect to do to go to a bigger office. But when you get there, if it doesn't have uh, an environment that you want, that inspires you, that gets people together to work together, to collaborate as, as, as we'd want from it, then, um, you know, is, is it worth having? So I think it, it, there's a whole number of considerations there um, that are open for further discussion, because I don't think there's anything new. We, we, we had it with a number of organizations, as I say, 20, 30 years ago, and we'd need to take another good look at it. Let's um, go back to the RISE model and a question from uh, Stephen Walker. Um, I think it's probably a question for Chris, but also uh, John and colleagues to, to offer a view. Um, and the, the question relates to the, the role that certification plays in occupational decisions. So Chris, uh, there's a whole plethora now of um, metrics which are available, wide score, PPC and uh, all sorts of BRIAM and um, as a customer looking at to evaluate a building you'll, 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 you have a much more information to work with than you may have had in, in previous years and, and RISE is an example of, of one of those um, metrics. What um, weight do you put on the availability of uh, the kind of uh, performance measures um, like wide score, EPC or, or indeed RISE? Is it going to help you or is it going to change your mind about which building you take or indeed uh, retain? Uh, I think, you know, when, when we go out and we, we, we're looking at opportunities to uh, perhaps acquire new offices, uh, you know, we, 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 we basically look at everything that's available and try to influence perhaps uh, those parties that we want to influence. So if there are uh, a number on our shortlist, uh, we will use the indices that are available to try and push for the very best. Um, uh, and I often find myself try, you know, spending a lot of time on this to try and uh, increase the, perhaps the developer or landlord's uh, awareness in some cases, but also justify why occupiers want certain things from buildings. And it's partly to push the push the boundaries a bit further than perhaps are there. I often, people, you know, developers say, well, we're not providing it because we don't think we have to. Well, who have you asked? And generally they haven't had that discussion with, with an occupier. Quite oftenly they'll have it with, with an agent. So agents apparently know everything about what occupiers want, but you know, they, they invariably don't, don't come to the occupier. So um, I think it's a basis for conversation. Um, we don't necessarily go out there to seek anything in particular, although BRIAM has always been top of our list in terms of ensuring that we've certainly got a level of sustainability in all of our buildings. Um, and we'll always encourage uh, developers to push for their very highest accreditation that's possible. So can I just uh, jump in there quickly, Howard, and just say um, that actually when we're when we're going through the the, the sort of audit rise audit process we do consider other certif um, certifications such as wide scored but i think where where we'd love to get to actually is wouldn't it be brilliant to be able to objectively um decide on your office building based on how well that building is performing and how well it's delivering customer experience which is ultimately what we're trying to quantify so if that could be adopted as a, an industry standard or something that, that um, other agents and landlords were, 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 were keen to explore. It would be a really powerful tool to, to combine all of these different um, certifications to say, this is how well this building actually performs and delivers customer experience. That's an interesting point, John, and uh, BCO have been working on uh, developing a, a customer experience award, which would be underpinned by some uh, scorecard. So potentially those things could work uh, together. Um, how important is it that uh, um, the, property, the property management industry, the operational side of running buildings is recognized? To date, a lot of focus has been on design and uh, appearance of buildings and, uh, and sustainability. I think it's, it's risen high, highly up the ladder. Is, is this now the era when operational management has come to the fore? Question for you, John, perhaps. Um, definitely. I think if we can um, recognise that and reward it, it only brings it higher up the agenda, um, provo provokes more 
more thought and um, increased service delivery. So, yeah, I think it's 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 fundamental, and and you will see over the next few years, people will be mulling of how to actually value um, customer experience and the impact that has on value, much like sustainability has over the last 10 years, um, customer experience will do. And how do you actually quantify that? So I think awards around it can only um, only be a positive thing. Excellent. Well, I, up, think, uh, uh, I do come in, Adam. We're coming up no, to the end. So uh, I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to each of our panellists just for a final word in a moment. But Adam, please, yeah, do comment. This, this can be my thought for the day, I guess. Um, Chris makes a really good point, actually, which, um, you know, it's not beyond the wit of man, really, to actually go and talk to our customers, yet it seems to be the biggest hurdle in the real estate industry and has been for a number of years. So actually, how do we democratise that process? How do we create more of a, a two-way conversation? Um, and I think that is really part of the, the biggest um, takeaway, certainly in the last uh, month or so, is actually having that, that kind of continuous open dialogue uh, with our occupiers, primarily about how to mobilise, you know, the workforce and how to make the workplace clean, safe, secure, um, pre uh, post COVID. But but secondarily, this let let let's make this pave pave the new way for um, uh, or open way of communicating with uh, the people that use our spaces. Okay, so I'll take that, Adam, as your uh, yes. final word. Thank so uh, wish for further. Um, much more dialogue between owners and uh, occupiers and uh, much more open uh, conversations. Uh, Tanya, from your perspective, what are you hoping for in the coming year in, in, in your uh, area of interest? Um, I think, you know, the future for, for sustainability is bright. Um, I know we're, we're living in um, uh, unprecedented times and, and there's a, you know, we're surrounded by a lot of tragedy, but there's positives that can be, can be born out of it. And I think that if you look at the sustainability sector, it's actually, it was born out of disaster. Um, the, you know, the environment and sustainability sector was created as a, as a direct result of, of terrible incidents like Novel, like the Savesco chemical plant explosion in Italy in the 70s and, and with each disaster the sustainability industry has gotten stronger and I think we'll emerge from this crisis stronger as well sustainability is here to stay um, and yeah we all need to to consider it more in everything that we do. Thank you thanks Tanya. Uh, your um, ambition uh, John your aspiration for rise in the coming year? You know, I, th I think it's using the the the, the positives around the increased collaboration um, that we've seen um, from COVID really to, to make a lasting change in terms of both sustainability, placemaking um, and awareness of wellness um, and, and just the overall customer experience. So I think we, we've seen almost an acceleration of it and let's not waste that opportunity to, to really drive home. Thanks, uh, John. And uh, we'll give uh, our customer Chris the, the final word. Um, having commissioned this research and having seen it morph into the RISE uh, case study, how, how are you feeling and, and uh, are you optimistic for customer experience in, in our industry? Well, really positive, uh, Howard. I mean, certainly from uh, you know where we were in 2015, as I was saying, to where we are now is... It seems like years, um, you know, we, we made tremendous progress and you can see by rise, you know, the before and after scores uh, of what it means to, you know, get this right and put a structure in um, that enables the occupier to have an input into the process. It's tremendously powerful. I, I would still encourage, you know, the uh, managing agents to be the educators in all of this, both in terms of trying to bring those occupiers along that perhaps are, are not engaging enough, uh, try to demonstrate the value of them getting uh, more involved in the management of their buildings. And that may even be going to a director or CEO within the business and sort of uh, saying uh, how you know, a well-managed building, uh, providing the right services can impact their, their staff and indirectly their staff impact their business and productivity. And, and also the education bit, obviously, with their client, the, the landlord, um, which is which is key to this, because some of my frustrations down the line has very much been that, you know, the services we provide, we, that we experience in our building have not had that occupier input. They've just been put out to tender. Uh, and the cheapest uh, has come along and assumed that that's what the occupier wants they want they want the cheapest possible services which clearly is not what we want we want the value for money we want the quality um, so 
keep all of my, as I say, Savile's been fantastic. They, they do manage a couple of our buildings. The engagement levels uh, since COVID uh, have rocketed. We've just got a, a nice pack that's come through telling us exactly what's going to happen. Uh, and we will be having meetings with them over the next two or three days. Can we have more of that as business as usual? And I think that would make uh, a huge difference oh, going right. forward. Well, uh, let me thank, on behalf of our many participants, thank you for, uh, to our participants for joining us today. Thank you to our panel, uh, John, Chris, uh, Tanya and Adam. Uh, Cover a lot of ground. And uh, thank, uh, say thank you for BCO for, for hosting today's event. Um, so goodbye and uh, keep safe and well. Thank you. Thanks, Howard. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.